nú bara segi ég hérna fundur fundur settur og góðan daginn öll sem mun ég vil byrja því að þakka ykkur fyrir góða þáttöku í þessari stafrænu ráðstefnu um öflugt barnastarf í söfnum og maður sér nú hérna mikið sömur nöfnum koma aftur á þennan fund en þetta er fyrir þau ykkar sem eru ný hér inni samstarfsverkefni listasafns Íslands og þjóðminnasafnsins. Þetta er ráðstefna sem hófst fyrir viku síðan 5. oktober á fyrirlestri Hæti Viktorsson frá sjóminnasafni Álandseyja þar sem sérstök ástæðlöð á barnmætt viðmót í sýningarsöfnum safnsins. Það er sérstaklega ánægjulegt hve margir tóku þátt í pallborðsumræðum í kjölfarið sem haldnar voru á miðvikudeginum í síðustu viku og það er mjög jákvæmt að geta haldið umræðinni lifandi og haldið áfram að ræða efni fyrirlestrana á svona sameilu vettvangi. Við munum því aftur efna til pallborðsumræðina á Teams næst komandi miðvikudag þar sem við ræðum erindi fyrirlestrana beggja. Við sendum út boð á þann viðburð og nánar upplýsingar síðar í dag. So now I'll switch to English and present Jok de Ninos from the Nordic Watercolor Museum in Sweden. In his lecture he will talk about the Nordic Watercolor Museum and its unique position as a museum located in the countryside, both exhibiting world famous artists and being an important part of the local community. Uh, he will also discuss the importance of art education and the museum at the museum and its role in a digitized democratic society. So here you go, Jonte. I will, yeah. yeah. Well, thank you. And, and thank you for your <laughs> introduction, Reinheider. Uh, it's, this is very, a very special occasion to me. I have never done any lecture like this before, so uh, bear with me. Uh, but uh, you can see the picture here, and it's uh, of course taken on a very beautiful evening here in Skärham. Uh, hopefully, you can also see the map, uh, where so you so you get a picture on where where we are actually. It's a small island north of Gothenburg on the Swedish west coast, and the island is called Schön, and the small village where the museum is is called um, Skärham, uh, and you probably can see the top of Denmark on the map as well. Uh, so at this place we are, uh, you can all in this picture, <clears throat> I'm sorry about that, in this picture you can also see our five cabins that you can rent and there's also this sculpture uh, made of uh, crates uh, which which is which belongs to our collection actually. Uh, it's, it's the green more uh, cylindric thing <laughs> to the left in the picture. Uh, so I'll move on now uh, and talk about the museum. Um, the museum opened in the year 2000, so we should have uh, celebrated 20 years now this year, but we couldn't because of COVID-19, of course. So we have to cancel all that kind of stuff. But uh, in, in, instead of being sorry, so we, we started to do things more digitally, and I will move on to that later as well. Uh, but the museum is a very special place uh, since we have been able to exhibit very famous artists during the years, such as Salvador Dali, Bill Viola, uh, Louis Bourgeois, etc. And we've also been exhibiting Swedish favorites like uh, Elsa Beskov and uh, Anders Sorn and Lars Lerin. I'm not sure if you're familiar with all the artists I will uh, talk about, but don't worry, you, you will pick up later, right? <laughs> uh, and I've been working at the museum since the year 2011. Uh, and I would say it's, it's still exciting. Uh, and also this great combination of working with a very traditional material uh, and, and being here on the countryside and uh, try to challenge that in so many different ways. The museum also, we used to say that the, that the museum tries to work with uh, watercolor in three different perspectives. And that's uh, watercolor as a tradition, watercolor as expression, and watercolor as, as a, 
concept. So I will show you a few examples and I will I will return to these three things during my talk. Uh, as tradition, I will give you this example. Uh, in the year 2007, I wasn't at the museum at that time. Uh, we had an exhibition with British watercolors spanning from over 200 years of painting. And uh, if you know a little bit about the watercolor, you probably know that uh, British watercolor is very, very traditional and also has a long tradition in so many ways. Uh, I chose this picture because it's dramatic uh, and it's also it's a very it's almost like a cliche, uh, <laughs> but I still love it. It's uh, by Paul Sand and it's called Stormy Sea with Castle Ruins and it's from the late 18th century. Um, I will move on because this this is this is will suit as an example for what the watercolor as tradition can be here at the museum. As an expression, I've chosen. Uh, uh, yeah, I think this is an upcoming key piece for the museum. Uh, it's a painting divided in three parts made by the Swedish artist called Lars Lerin. He is very popular here in Sweden, but he's not that well known in the other parts of the world actually. Maybe in some parts of Europe, maybe on Iceland, I'm not sure. Uh, but he's definitely popular in Sweden. He has his own TV show and he has been on radio many times. Uh, but that's Lars and what he's famous for. He's also a fantastic watercolor painter and he adds a lot of expression, I think, to his work. And people have, people have so much emotions around his uh, Paintings. If you have an, if you are, if you have been able to have a guided tour and show one of his pieces, people always talk about uh, what they feel when they see it. Uh, and and I, I don't want to simplify this, but uh, this this is not a complex picture. It's a birch forest, but people still want to talk about what they see. Uh, if you're very observant, you in the left of the of the picture, you can see a small mouse. And that's a that's a very funny thing that Lars do. He puts these tricky things in his pictures, and also these very strange patterns that show up uh, in in the picture as well. Uh, so watercolor as as an expression, uh, I I have to say this as well. We exhibited we had a huge exhibition with Lars works in the year two thousand and fourteen, and during that year, but this was mainly the summer. We had over two hundred thousand visitors, so it was crazy completely crazy. And this is, of course, before COVID-19, which changed everything. Well, watercolor as concept then. Uh, examples here. Uh, this is a piece by Bill Viola from the year 2005. And uh, we exhibited Bill here at our museum. Hold on. <laughs> I just stick to my notes here. I was actually working here at the museum then. It was uh, in the year 2012. And it was a blast because the museum was all darkened and filled with Bill, Bill Viola's gigantic uh, video projections. Um, but the visitors weren't that pleased at all. Some of them went actually became actually a little bit angry because they they couldn't see any watercolors and they were they were visiting the Nordic Watercolor Museum, and it's. This is also a summer exhibition, and I must say that that summers are really important to us here at the museum, because uh, Schoen and especially Scherham is a tourist destination. It's a very uh, and it's a very popular one, and of course everyone wants to go to the watercolor museum. So the summer summers are really important to us, and also that that we, since we are a trust. Uh, we we are we we need the the fund we need the income from the tickets that we sell, and we are also funded. But the, the ticket incomes is still a, an important part of all this. So uh, Bill Viola was maybe not a success in that way, but it was a great exhibition. And those who actually saw it, and de and decided to take part of it, were were thrilled. Uh, and why did we show Bill Viola's work here? Well. The, well Think of watercolor as concept, and we used the uh, videos that uh, the Bill made where he, I'm not sure if you're familiar with Bill's work, but he, he uses the four elements. Uh, and he, this, in, this, in this case, we chose work from him where he worked with water. And water has a definite connection to watercolor, right? Without 
water, no watercolor painting. So it's that easy in that way. Uh, I move on with another conceptual piece that we showed at our museum. And now we are in the year 2015 and we have this group exhibition with, with Icelandic art. Uh, I know that many of you listeners are from Iceland uh, and I hope that you have been able to see this work because it's from the year 2007 and it's called Water Vocal Endangered and it was installed in our big hall here. We, had, we, 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 ex we extended the museum in 2012 and got 400, 400 more square meters. So it's in that big room that we had the for fortune to install Ruri's amazing piece. And this is, this is exciting. People weren't angry about this piece. They were thrilled. They were knocked down. They were absolutely lyric about it. They were totally, it was a blast uh, to, to show this piece. And for the and I will try to explain this uh, for those who haven't uh, experienced it. It's like these huge projections of Icelandic waterfalls, and as you come closer to the projection, the sound increases, so it almost shakes your ears. Uh, so, watercolor as concept, right? <laughs> Well, we also have, since we are a museum, we have a museum collection and it consists of traditional watercolor, watercolor as expression, watercolor as concept, plus the picture book. Uh, since watercolors are used in so many parts of the making of a picture book. Uh, but we are, aren't a historical museum, so all, all the stuff in our collection is contemporary, but it's, it can still be traditional. And here's an example. This is the Swedish artist Fredrik Söderberg, and uh, it's a very big diptych. These pictures are huge. They are like approximately, I think, uh, yeah, they are like two meters high or something, uh, and one point five meters wide each. Uh, so quite big pictures. And Fredrik uses very traditional watercolor techniques. And on on the left side, he he refers to architectural sketches and drawings and presentations made in the 19th century. Uh, in this case, he had, he had painted a very special house. It's uh, called Jung's house uh, with a special mandala on top. And he combined that with uh, Rudolf Steiner-esque waterish greenish pictures. So this is, uh, and it's th that part is called Der Traum. So this is very, very traditional in that sense. This belongs to the museum collection. And we had the, a couple of years ago, we had an exhibition with the solo exhibition with Fredrik Söderberg and lots of these kinds of work that he does. So I move on. This is a watercolor as an expression. And this is a, a, a detail from one of the series that the German artist Bernd Kubeling has made. And it's called Blooming Melancholy. And um, Bernd actually paint these pictures on Iceland time and it's flowers. Uh, and he paints them like very, very intense. It's, it's, it's very, the production of these pictures are very intense and very direct and very intuitive. And it's very, it's very expressive, but on the other hand, it's very concrete as well because it's, uh, it's, it is flowers. Uh, I'll move on. Here we have another example of watercolor as concept, and this is in our collection now. This is the Icelandic water, uh, artist Solveig Adelsteins daughter. And it, this has been in our collection since the year 2000. And it's called Evaporated Watercolors in Glass. And you, you might think that this work is playful and nice and cool, but people can be very provoked by this. It's, it, it's very good to learn. It's very educational to work with a piece like this. People can all, almost get angry because they say, I can do this. And then as an art educator, you must always return the question, well, would you? And then they go like, people go like, no, nah, I'm not sure. <laughs> well, why wouldn't you? I have to ask them. And so the discussion goes on. And that's one of the important things with art education, to keep the dialogue alive. Uh, and this is a fantastic piece to talk with the, the visitors about. I move on. Here's another conceptual piece in our collection, and it's it's the text printed here on outside of the museum. Hopefully you can see it. In the background, you can see the 
the lighthouse by Winter and Herbelt, as I mentioned be earlier before. So it, it's placed on the wharf outside of the museum, and it's a it's a short news text actually called Singing Habit Inhabitants, and it's uh, about a group of people uh, living on a special gro uh, group of islands near Papaya Guinea, which is uh, sinking, and that was 20 years ago. These islands haven't sunken under the sea yet, but it's very difficult to live there. Uh, I'm not sure if I have a translation text, but maybe I can get one and I can uh, give it to you later if you are curious what 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 does the whole, the whole text says. But it's important to know that the people there are still they are surviving, and of course this kind of text brings a lots of thoughts when you are on an island so close to the sea and the sea levels are still rising all over the world. So a lot of thoughts and a lot of uh, talking, of course, if you decide to show this piece to uh, an audience and to be able to uh, work with uh, art education around it. Very exciting piece to show. And then we also have the picture book. Uh, and this is an example. We have several picture books in our collection. Uh, this is uh, a picture book uh, called The Billy Goat's Gruff and the Swimming Pool. Uh, and it's a modern version of, of an old story which you all might know uh, of these three goats going over a bridge and there's this troll hiding under, under it. But this is a modern version and it's illustrated by Grim Morrison. Uh, and she's, a, she's a Norwegian picture book artist. Uh, so I think I move on from there. And I'll stick to these uh, to these three things here, uh, uh, but I'll switch them a little bit. I'll move over my presentation and take my perspective on how the work the museum works with all its content. Because I've shown you just a little glimpse of all of what of all the stuff that we do, uh, and I'll focus on us being very traditional, digital, and educational. Uh, we are traditional in that sense uh, that we work with this in our workshops. And now I talk as an art educator, uh, working mainly with groups from the school, but of course also gr groups of adults that have booked, uh, maybe they want to try out watercolor for a couple of hours or so. But this, this is the core and uh, this is the color wheel uh, by Johannes Itten. I hope you're familiar with it. <laughs> and, and, and also the, the, the three primary colors, yellow, blue and red. These are very important in all our workshops. I mean, sometimes we might even use them in the workshop, but they're still important. They're always there in the background. This method of mixing colors and learning by doing and being in an experimental mode and allow yourself to test and try. Uh, hopefully, there will start a video now where uh, you can see someone mixes these colors. I'm not sure if if it will start. Oh, here we go. Well, you can see the mixing process here. So I mix the secondary colors, which are orange, purple and green, and then you must try to paint with them. So let's see if I can change the slide. And here's more color mixing. This is a part of a color wheel which is mixed like this. Uh, this uh, this kind of workshop isn't possible anymore, so we had to make it in another way this summer. But this is from the summer in 2019. Uh, and this is where this is a course that we do during the summer where you attend as an adult plus child. So it could be grandfather plus grandchild and, or father plus child. And uh, of course, grandmother, mother, etc you probably get the concept. So so we have this course and it's for three days and uh, it's a couple of hours each day 
and this is this is where we start. Uh, we start by mixing this uh, color wheel just to understand it in a group. And there is also this importance, which I think have been lost now uh, because of the COVID-19. The intense dialogue that you can have with the one you sit next to. Why are you mixing your purple like that? Mine is becoming more bluish. How did you get that orange one, etc.? The dialogue is important. It's always important in art education. And the combination of doing something very obvious, like mixing colors and talk about it, that's also important. And that's how, at least I think, we learn things. This is also how I think that we work very traditional. This is also from this adult plus child course that we do during the summer. Uh, this is this summer, actually. We're doing landscape painting outside. So this is uh, this is on the small island where the where the cabins were. It's called Bokholmen. So if you go up on that island, you have this view where you can sit and do landscape painting. And here's another traditional part. I'm not sure if you're you, you can you see the the guy in the shirt in the picture. That's Mats Gustafsson. We had a fantastic opportunity to have a one day workshop with him here when we had his exhibition at our museum. I know that he was exhibiting on Iceland as well. <laughs> but this, but as you know, Mats is also very traditional in his way of, of expression. I mean, so, so that's also a way for us to be traditional, actually. I mean, Mats is not uh, about concept or anything like that. This is very traditional. And of course, this this workshop was completely fully booked and, and, and very loved because Mats is a, such a great person to work with. Uh, but still, it's traditional, very traditional. And learning, of course. Well, how is this very traditional museum in this very traditional format and material becoming digital now? Well, we are, as, as far as I'm concerned, during the years I've been here and even way back, we have been open for all kinds of experiments and testing things. And this is, this is one of the most strangest things I've been testing as art educator ever. Uh, and it's called Telepresence Robot. Uh, someone somewhere else can actually steer the thing that looks at my col colleague here, Linnea Axelsson. Uh, uh, this is a commercial robot uh, and it's uh, constructed by Double robotic, Robotics and it was in a project that we did together with uh, RISE Interactive. RISE is uh, Research Institutes of Sweden uh, and here in, and their node in Gothenburg does all these kind of uh, digital and uh, telepresence things among thousands of other projects that they do. But we made this, this was one of the robot projects that we did together with them and, and it was the first. Uh, and it was, um, the, the groups that were supposed to attend to this were elder people uh, living in the Swedish countryside, so they could visit the museum without being able to actually. But we had some troubles with the technique. This robot weren't good enough for what we needed. In this uh, thing from uh, Double Robotics, the, there, there's an iPad in it, so the camera isn't that good or weren't. This is a couple of years ago. It was in 2013 we started this. So th the technique has become better. But we, we didn't give up. We, we, we continued with the next robot project and RISE Interactive, they decided that, um, that to build their own robot. Now this video here is loading. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> uh, so maybe you should load anytime soon. So they decided to build their own robot and we test drive and we made a test drive for a year at our museum with that. So I just pause myself, have a sip of water while the video loads.
Oh, no. <laughs> Sorry. So as you can see, this robot looks much more primitive, but it's uh, it has more uh, technique in it and it's more advanced. It has several cameras and it has better audio, etc. But it was it was also very fragile. So we have to have two technicians with it all the time it, 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 to take care of it. Uh, so since since the video is very slow loading, so I move on to the next picture. Uh, that project lasted for uh, a year and uh, our sort of experience from that is that uh, telepresence robotics is very complex but it's it's still very interesting so we haven't given up on that part and this is our recent uh, most recent test drive with the robots and it's the small thing on the floor actually uh, and it's called Robit, and it's also developed by rice interactive and we made a test drive last week with it and uh, and the picture is from our current exhibition with Andreas Eriksson, where he is showing his weavings. And here is uh, the one who actually does the weavings for uh, Andreas. She's called Sara Eriksson. So she's sitting there talking to the robot, uh, not the robot actually, but someone who is steering the robot at the museum. Uh, so the, the, the thrill here is to steer the, to sit somewhere else and steer the robot. And theoretically, you can go anywhere in the museum as long as the technique works. This is still a very sensitive technique, but it's fun to work with and it's great for education when it works and it will be will be working someday, I think, because, yeah, you know, everything is becoming more and more robotic. And I think it's good that museums do this kind of thing, that robotics own, does not only belong to the big companies uh, such as Google, Amazon, etc. So I'll move on now. Uh, and how did we digitize our art education during the COVID-19? And what did we do with it? Before COVID-19, we did the guided tours digitally. Uh, maybe this video will load slow as well. But uh, our main channel at that time was Instagram. Um, and this is an example from, from Facebook that we've been using more now. Uh, but then when COVID-19 came, we had to sort of do more of this content. Uh, and this is an example when my colleague Linnea shows uh, this birch forest picture that I was talking about earlier. Uh, and, and how just, just so you get a picture on how it works. We, u we use mobile phone and a very simple mic to do this uh, digital uh, sort guided tours. So she walks in here and we, we always have technical problems with this. I'm not sure if you hear the sound, but it's 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 sounds a lot from the microphone, etc. Yeah, I, I'm stopping it there. So uh, I'm not sure if you have experienced this, uh, but the technique is always the problem because Linnea, she made an ex excellent presentation, but in, this, in the start of this presentation, we had troubles with the microphone. Uh, so there is always something with the technique. It's fascinating and fun, but sometimes frustrating as well. Uh, but we're still developing this and we're we're moving into more advanced technologies and maybe also change the way we do these kind of uh, guided tours. Uh, so we'll see where we end up. Um, let's see if I can change slide now. Uh, this is one thing that we also digitized. Uh, hopefully you can see a small wooden bag in these two pictures here. here. It's called Upptäckarväskan. It's a bag that we made a couple of years ago. And it was, uh, and we've been having it at the museum every, all all the year away. We change the content sometimes, and it's filled with the different tools to explore art uh, and the environment here at the museum. It, it uh, yeah, it could be a binocular, it could be a drawing book, whatever, all kinds of stuff we fill in that one. And we also made this uh, set of activity cards if you're if you need to 
find out something to do at the museum or in the surroundings. But due to COVID-19, we have to cancel this thing completely, as you probably understand. So we, we, we tried this instead. We made online videos with things to do. Uh, video will load properly. Yes, it does. Um, and in, in this case, it's, it's uh, my colleague Linnea again. She's, uh, she's, she's giving, so we, instead of this bag, we had, we had this tip where, where people, different kinds of things that people could do. And, and they had to, of course, view this on YouTube. That's the, that's the boring part of it, but it's, it's digital, so it might work out. But it, it's also good for us here at the museum to try new formats, new ways to express ourselves and try new ways for education. I think digital education is hard uh, and it, it, sor it sort of it needs its, its own way to, to do things because it's, it's not like ordinary TV. Uh, I'm not a TV person at all, but uh, so that's also new. I mean, you have to work with scripts, etc., and you have to rehearse and so on. Different working in this digital format. Um, but at least we tried and we have had some views of these videos. Uh, but of but of course it it can't really replace this uh, this toolbox of discovery this kit of discovery tools that I described earlier. So uh, oh here is also here's also an, a new thing that we do. This is our our very primitive but still working uh, cool uh, video studio. And in the background here you have Christian Berglund and Simone Frankel who's doing a lot of the digital content here at the museum. So they are always behind the cameras. Uh, and they, as you can see, we're mixing the three primary colors again. Uh, there's a video of me doing this. I'm not sure if we, we should see that. Uh, I'm, I'm using sugar lumps to, to mix them. So it might be fun to see that. <laughs> Oops. Yeah, so if if you don't have anything to do this afternoon, uh, try to paint paint the three sugar lumps with watercolor and and put them in on a plate and pour water on them. It's exciting. <laughs> uh, this is this is also a thing that we've been trying to do in the picture. You see my colleague Linnea and uh, we're we're trying to make a workshop together with a uh, of middle school kids uh, in a town nearby here called Stenningsund. And since we can, we can do this since we are very good friends with their art teacher. Uh, and she she's very patient with us, but it, it's very complex. So to to get them to listen and to both see and hear us through this mobile device that we use. So I show this as an example that that we don't that all things we do aren't a success and that digital is very complex and communication and education with physical materials are very complex uh, so we're still exploring this because uh, kids who are 13 years old in the classroom well it's it's very hard to communicate with them if you aren't there actually that well, that was that was very striking to us of course, their teacher was around, uh, Maria, there are teachers, she fa she's fantastic, but she did also have a hard time to get them to sit down and listen to us. So it's, I think it's important to point out that the, dif the difficulties of uh, this digital era that we sort of stumbled into uh, due to COVID-19. A lot of funny things have happened, a lot of difficult things have happened, but I think it's important to, to don't give up and to keep on exploring new things and change. I mean, if something is, if something goes wrong, change your way to do it. And there is more to discover. If you want to look at us digitally, go, go you can copy these different links here. Uh, you can check out the, our Facebook page, our YouTube page, our Instagram. There's more to see, just go ahead. 
I must also mention liquid fiction. Uh, it's a digital residue, which uh, was a project that lasted uh, during 2019 and is now being at its finishing parts. Uh, and uh, it was very exciting because we have, we have for many years, we have had this uh, physical residency here called Seven Days, which artists from all over the world can apply to. Uh, and they, then they can stay in one of these cabins and do what they want for seven days. Most of the artists who come here, they actually do a lot of work then. Uh, but this was, this was something different. This was a way for us to explore if a digital residency could be possible at all. Some of the residency artists in this project were actually here and some of, and some of them were also doing their stuff digitally and they were from all around the world actually. Uh, you can see that they were from from Russia and uh, yeah etc. <laughs> so they, they have to work on the, uh, from Mexico, we have a writer from Mexico and, and all this was possible because of the, the digital era of course but it became even more intense when the COVID-19 arrived. So do check out Liquid Fiction, this web page here, because it's very, very exciting. I, I must recommend it to you. I can see that my time is uh, coming up, so I, I won't uh, explore this Liquid Fiction page for you, but it's exclusively online art, actually, made for this project. So go visit. It's super exciting. The museum will uh, will keep this web page up during 2020. 21 and 2022 as far as we know. We are not sure if we are going to keep on doing this kind of residency because it's it's very far off from from what we do but it's also very important to for us to experiment and push the boundaries of what the water what color museum can do. So so I'm not saying that this is the end but check check this out. It's very exciting. And it's very exciting to explore online art. The art pieces there are made to be explored from with a computer screen. So how are we educational? And these are my thoughts on how the museum has, is working educationally. Oh, this is a picture of me and my colleague Linnea Axelsson. And I must mention her because she is so important. We are sort of a dynamic duo here. She's so important to the content that we put up and also she's very important because she has the whole responsibility for the contacts with the school in the municipality of Chern and also in the regions. So thanks to Linnea, the schools actually start to visit us this autumn. Uh, they completely stopped visiting us this spring because of COVID-19. But Linnea, she is, she, is, um, all, she is just as important as I am to the development of uh, of art education here at the museum. So I, I have to show you this picture. <laughs> uh, well, this is what art education is, is to me and what I try to, to sort of perform when I do art education. And it's all about attention. I'm, I mean, being caring in, of the situation and take care of the group that you meet uh, in a workshop or when you look at art in the exhibition. And you also, end up with the resistance might be your own resistance as an art education as an art educator or the group's resistance and that's important stuff uh, when someone in the group says no I don't like this this is bullshit that is good stuff for an art educator and it's also difficult how do you tackle it how do you work with it uh, these are very important questions. I should not answer them now, I should, but I should raise them. There are, there are def different kind of method methods to deal with this kind of resistance, but I want to point it out as an important energy in the development and in the work with art educations and especially at museums. And I want to put action into it as well, because doing something is also important. And that's why we do this combination here at our museum, that we have a workshop, uh, which often starts with uh, me taking a look at the art in the, in the museum and then go up and do a workshop, but it could be vice versa. And here's an example of this, uh, how we do these guided tours and these workshops. And, and this is, of course, all these pictures now are, are 
the, some of them are most of them are pre COVID-19, but uh, but now the, the school groups are visiting us again. And this this is what I was was trying to talk about earlier in that earlier sketch. And uh, another version is look, talk, do, learn. It's also important. Uh, in the background, uh, where the students are in the exhibition area, you can see pictures of the Swedish artist uh, Maria Nordin and the workshop that we did. And to to mimic art is also with your body is also important because I think that you learn with your body as well. So that combination of being both theoretical to express your thoughts and to do something, to draw, to paint. The hand and the brain has a very complex uh, and uh, intimate uh, history and will ne we'll never start to develop, I think. Uh, here's another example of how we work with Mats Gustafsson. You, we had a, a fantastic ex exhibition with him. And just, just to show you some of his pieces, some of them might be have been on Iceland as well. And this is a, a few pictures from, from the exhibition that we had with Mats. And here's the workshop. Just uh, when we looked at the art with the students, we just went through and talked about the pictures and they were shocked about the nude pictures that Mats made and they were fascinated about the fashion. Uh, but they, the, the, real, the real thrill for the kids were this workshop where we had these Barbie dolls that they, they first were assigned to make some kind of designed uh, dress for the doll with a, a simple piece of paper uh, and they and they just uh, cut and put tape and this etc and they made these fantastic clothes to them and the next next thing were that they were supposed to be like Mats, a fashion illustrator and to paint the, the dress that they, that they have made so some examples of, of this and then in contrast as the same autumn, uh, we had Nancy Spiro. Nancy Spiro does not live anymore, but she was a completely different artist compared to Mats. Uh, she was very political, poetic and aggressive in her expression. And how did we work with that? Well, for, first of all, we didn't work with small kids at all in this exhibition because it was too complex. Uh, we worked with middle school and up. Uh, so here are some examples of Nancy Spiro's work. Uh, and here is Linnea showing these exhibitions for, uh, I think these are, are uh, middle grade students. And this is not the correct picture, but you can see the words ja and nej. It goes like yes and no. So the workshop started with that we, um, we, talked, uh, we talked about uh, we, we, we put up different questions that the students have to decide whether they liked it or not, if you follow me. So, so it was all about opinions, because Nancy Spiro was very much about opinions. <clears throat> and moving on from that, we wanted the, 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 the students uh, to make pictures of their opinions, actually. And there, they, they came up with thousands of pictures that they made. Uh, I have to put this one up because this is a very case sensitive picture that showed up and it, it became a rather heavy argument, but the students uh, fixed it and we did too. It's the flag of Kurdistan, which they divided uh, because they wanted to show their uh, sort of sort of how how sad and how angry they feel about their homeland not existing at all. Uh, and you can see there were all kinds of different uh, messages here, not only ho strong political, but things about love and OK Boomer, etc. And, and of course, finishing by showing the work, what you have done for each other. It's also important. If you have the time, do so and discuss it. Uh, I'm not sure if I'm going to, can I get five more minutes? <laughs> all right. Uh, because I just want to mention this important stuff in the art educational toolbox. I will keep it short now because I've been talking for 45 minutes. This uh, the Socratic dialogue. Uh, if if you haven't heard of it, go look it up. I'm not using it this very precise as it's expressed is, is as it is expressed here, but you can have it sort of in, in, in your backbone when you when you have a school group. It helps out, and if you make a practice out of it and and work work it like I I put up here, it it can be fantastic. You can have a fantastic discussion, 
but it's difficult and fun. So that's the Socratic dialogue. And then there's this thing called the aesthetic learning process. Uh, and I borrowed this from the Chern municipality. When we talk about aesthetic learning processes, it refers to thoughts on learning and education that emphasize a holistic perfect perspective on the human being where thinking, feeling, doing and reflecting and seeing are seen as equally important parts. And this is a model of it. Uh, I shouldn't go into explaining this, but it's called the aesthetic learning process and it's developed by a Swedish uh, sci uh, art re uh, educational researcher called Lars Lindström. Uh, Go check it out because I think, as you can see from from this picture here, all these things overlap each other, and it's important for you as an art educator to know if you're learning within or through the arts. For example, there's nothing wrong, and there is nothing if if you do either way. Nothing can go wrong really, but it's important to know where you are as an educator and what kind of methods you use. And if you're only using one method, why not try to make it overlap another method? Uh, the Chern Municipality Art School has made this, this, this thing more as a workflow where they describe how their students sort of move through this workflow and, and they, it ends up with a, a very specific result. Uh, the aesthetic learning process. So it's it's about experiencing with with all your senses. Actually, that's that's the best. Uh, that's the most. Yeah, maybe that's the content of it. Uh, but I, I maybe I should go come back with another lecture on aesthetic learning processes. <laughs> I'll move on. Uh, we have also a research project here called the study. Artistic gaze. In Swedish, we have so shortened it down to socks. So here we discuss all these things about what art education is. And we have researchers who have done a lot of research on me and Linnea, for example, while we were having different groups. And we also published this book, which uh, unfortunately only is in Swedish. But for those who might understand that, you can download it from the museum webpage. Uh, and this group is a think tank for art education, I should say. And you can here's the list of persons who are participating in it. So um, go check it out. And we're we're trying to find new methods and means for art education in a larger context. Uh, and these are my very personal thoughts on uh, the future of art education in museums, because I think art education is important for democracy and especially in a digitized area. You must learn to discuss and criticize pictures, but also text. But pictures must be also be formed into text. And I've illustrated this with this picture. It looks like it might look miserable, but I think you know where I'm pointing at, that this doesn't work out, that you have to move in different directions. This can only be a part of art education that you mimic and repeat. You must also try to explore and make your own experience as a student, but also as an art education, art educator. You never get fully learned, never. <laughs> and here's also another reflection of mine that art education. Is. To discover the other world, this is an old picture and might look be, might look a little bit funny. But I think it says a lot. Try to discover the other world. That's what art education is for. Uh, and uh, this is a very nice film clip that I want to end my talk with. It's uh, from Blade Runner 2049. Uh, and um, while this is loading, I will I will say thank you for listening to me. I'm sorry that I went a bit fast in the end and uh, I, I did you hope have some you get some new thoughts or maybe some new questions and feel free to ask me. I mean, you can reach my email. Uh, I will be quiet now so you can hear.
Well, thank you. I'll, I've unmuted myself now. Thank you, Jante, for your great presentation. It was very inspiring. Uh, now we have uh, time for some questions, 10 to 15 minutes, um, and I'll be monitoring the questions, um, inviting those who raise their hands to speak directly to you and uh, putting their camera on. So, um, fyrir þau ykkar sem eru að taka þátt og hafi spurningar uh, til Jónti, að þá getið þið ítt á hendi sem er hérna uppi í stikunni, næfst í forritinu uh, og þannig getum við svona haldið þessu og fokkalega skipulöðu. Um, þannig að gjörum svo vel að ef einhver hefur spurningar að rétta upp hönd. Um, maybe I'll start with uh, one, one question. I have a question about uh, the school groups that you yeah. uh, are inviting to your, your museum and being located in the, in the countryside, do you, um, are you having a large number of, of school groups coming um, to your museum and uh, are the workshop part of the guided tours always? Do they always get a guided tour and a workshop as well? Uh, yeah, we we used before COVID-19, we used to have a lot of uh, school groups um, and also a lot of school groups coming here by bus. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, from from the from the rest part of the region where we live, the Gothenburg region to simplify it. Uh, so it, it was quite usual. But then when COVID-19 came, it, they, it stopped immediately. Uh, but the, the main school groups that we work with are at the municipality here at Churn. We, we have uh, we have a cooperation with the municipality that says that's that says that the school groups have the right to visit the museum. The museums uh, for the the museum visit uh, visits are free for the schools here at the municipality. If you're mm -hmm. if you're outside of Sharon, you have to pay. It's a small sum, but you still have to pay. So the biggest problem for the school groups outside of Sharon used to be the 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 cost of the bus here, because they have to rent a separate bus. And the guided tour is always included in the workshop. It's, so it's always a guided tour plus workshop, but it could be vice versa. Yeah. It's we, because it, we think it's important to. To, to look at or to talk about it and to express your feelings uh, vocally <laughs> mm -hmm. and then, yeah. then to do something. But it could be that you start with the workshop and then go and look at the art. Uh, in the case with Nancy Spear, we started with the workshop and then took a look at Nancy's work because Nancy's work is so striking, it's so rough. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, thank you. And I also noticed you have a, a really good space for your workshops at the museum. Oh yeah, yeah. That's we actually actually this is this is pure art education luxury. We have three workshops, mm -hmm. and the one that you saw where the cameras were all set up and where I have taken some of the pictures of Mats doing his workshop. That's that's it's called Experiment Werkstan, the expen experimental workshop. Sounds sounds thrilling, but it's it's an excellent workshop actually. It's it, yeah, it's. A, <laughs> Yeah, I, c I can imagine it's a, a dream for every art educator to have a, a space like that. Yep. Uh, so we have a, a, a question from Guðrún Jóna. Um, so, um, uh, yes, hi Jante. Uh, hi. Over the works, no, over the weekends, you have workshop for families. You have work workshops for families over the weekends. Oh, on, only in only in the summertime we have these uh, special uh, adult plus child workshops. But uh, over the weekends in in the autumn and uh, and winter spring we have we have a smaller and more simple workshop with which is like uh, open to anyone really and you where you can uh, explore watercolor on your own. We, ha we have one one person working there, which isn't really an art educator, uh, but they supply you with the watercolors and give you a few simple tips. Uh, but um, so, so what was that a good answer to your question? 
Uh, yes, I was thinking, how do you advertise your workshops over the weekends? Oh, we advertise them on uh, on our web page and on Instagram. And uh, people who visit the museum, they they also when when they realize that there is so this that we have this workshop open, they they ask if they can attend to it. And now due to COVID-19 is very limited, so we can only have eight persons in that workshop uh, mm -hmm. for that specific occasion each each hour. So it's very limited. So it's it's terrible, I think, because I think that as much as as many people as possible should be able to to paint with watercolor. Yeah. And we all, we also have these holidays workshop. So we we will try to have a drop in workshop actually due due to Halloween. But we'll see if that works out. We are not sure if if it if it becomes too crowded, we have to close it down. So we'll try. Yeah. Thank you. So do we have any more uh, questions? The, uh, if there aren't any more questions, I, I can explain why I show you this Blade Runner film clip. <laughs> yes, please do. I, I think you should look it up because it's very interesting what they say. But the thing that I was thinking about, because he he this 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 robot person, he's he's at this memory maker's place, and I think that that's what art educators are. We are memory makers and we are fantasy makers, but we aren't in the Blade Runner robotic situa situation yet. We are in real life, but we are still memory and fantasy makers, and that's important. Yeah, I I agree to that. So we have um, Rapnildur. Yes, thank you for a very interesting um, lecture. I was wondering about your digital content now that you have a lot of it online. How are the viewings? How are people giving you feedback and are they really using the digital content? Uh, the, view, the viewing is the, view, the viewing is OK. We are quite new to YouTube. Uh, we have been there for actively for uh, one year almost, uh, maybe two years, but really active this this year, of course, due to COVID-19. Uh, but but the but the but the strongest activity that we experience is on Facebook, actually, because the museum, mu the museum's Facebook page has so many followers. So if if we make a guided tour there, we show one art piece and we talk about it for like seven or ten minutes, we we have lots of followers on that one. So so that that's the best part, and that's our best experience so far. Instagram was okay, but not with the not with the guided tours. Instagram is better for just showing examples or being just a social contact and showing stills actually from the exhibition or examples of watercolor paintings that other people have, have done, etc. So that that's uh, well, that's my best answer so far. <laughs> oh, that's good. Thank you. Well, Thank you very much again, Jonte, and uh, we will be uh, sharing the, your presentation with the participants. Um, so uh, I think we'll, we'll end, end this now if we don't have any more questions. Um, okay. okay, well, well, thank you very much and uh, we will check on your, your website and, and the links that you, you've sent us for your museum. Yeah, do so. And and also, if you're curious about the artists that we have been exhibiting, you can find our YouTube channel where uh, Christian Bergen has made interviewed uh, these interview documentaries with with several artists that we have ex exhibited during the year. So that's also another digital product that I didn't exemplify this time. So there are tons of stuff. And and for those who look at this uh, afterwards, etc., or might have any questions afterwards, to contact me regarding mm -hmm. the aesthetical learning process or, or so, the Socratic uh, kind of thinking, talking <laughs> workshop. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so I, do I, I actually have one question that I just thought of, of now. Um, are the artists usually participating in the, the workshops? Artists mm -hmm. that are ex exhibiting at your... Uh, no, that's I, very rare. Uh, uh, I noticed Mats Gustafsson yeah. there. 
yeah, yeah, Mats, that that was very special. So it, that's it, it's very rare that they actually do that. We mm -hmm. we we ask them, but most of them says actually says no thanks. <laughs> very polite, but, yeah. but but Mats Mats he couldn't say no. <laughs> okay, well, I was just curious to hear. Well, okay, thank you, and we will we will be in in touch again. Yeah, thank you all for listening. Thank you very much. Okay, thank, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye. Thank you.